Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we're going to take a look at sort of the base standard version of the SIG 550. This is a 550 dash Two. It is essentially identical to the Swiss military Sturmgewehr 90, just with different markings, because it didn't go to the Swiss Army. It was sold on the international commercial market instead. Uh, a big thanks to the Bear Arms Reference Collection in Scottsdale, Arizona, for giving me access to bring this rifle to you guys. This is an authentic, made in Switzerland SIG 550. So the story here begins well, back in the 1960s, uh, I should say, SIG has a nomenclature system where they went with 200 series guns for their pistols, 300 for their submachine guns, and 500 for their rifles. And going into the 1960s, the Swiss were armed with the Sturmgewehr 57, which was the SIG 510. And it is oh, this beast of a rifle, which is quite heavy, quite expensive to manufacture. Is chambered for the 7.5 Swiss cartridge, big 30 caliber cartridge. Sig knew that the trend was moving towards lighter, handier 5.56 caliber rifles, and so in the 1960s they actually partnered with Beretta to develop a new 5.56 caliber rifle for military use. Now, this partnership didn't really work out very well, uh, and the two companies, after a couple of years, parted ways. SIG, in the direct aftermath, produced the SIG 530, which was a very interesting rifle on its own. We'll do a video on one of those someday when I can get my hands on one, but it was very limited production. It was actually a uh, gas-operated roller-locked rifle, and it did not work well for SIG. Uh, within a couple of years, by the late 1960s, they had iterated to the SIG 540 instead. And the 540 is the basis of what we have here. The 540 was in many ways, well, it was in many ways similar to the Beretta AR-70, which is sort of the result of this partnership between the two companies for a while. Uh, but it was also very similar to the Kalashnikov. In some ways, you can look at a SIG 550 under the skin as a Swiss-made Kalashnikov. And you'll see that when we pull this rifle apart. So, uh, SIG made a few improvements in the 1970s, and iterated their design number to 541. And the 541 is almost identical to what we have here. The last changes were made in 1981, uh, at which point the rifle was formally adopted by the Swiss military as, uh, well, SIG called it the SG550, the Swiss military adopted it as the Sturmgewehr 90. Now, during the 1970s, the rifle was kind of in a holding pattern while the Swiss government, the Swiss military, was experimenting with a couple of different cartridges. They were doing rifle trials, looking at various other guns. Uh, they developed a cartridge they called the 5.6 Iger, which was essentially just a Swiss-specified 5.56 NATO. Uh, they also experimented with a 6.35 and a 6.45 millimeter cartridge. In fact, I have a couple videos on some of the Waffenfabrik Bern rifles that competed against SIG's entry for what would eventually be the next Swiss military rifle. But finally, 1981 it's approved. Um, 1982, 1983, the contract is drawn up with SIG. Uh, I'm sorry, the rifle is approved in 82. The contracts are drawn up with SIG. Funding is approved by Parliament. It's a, a long process to get the rifle into production. So before we further go into detail on the production, let's take a look at what this rifle actually is internally. This doesn't look like an AK from the outside, uh, but I assure you it is on the inside. So we'll take a look at that. But first let's uh, check out the markings here. We have our Swiss proof mark here. We have the model designation SG550-2. This indicates that this was a commercial production rifle, not military. If this had gone to the Swiss military, it would be marked STGW, or Sturmgewehr 90. Uh, the dash 2 is because there were two different uh, variations made of these rifles based on rifle twist. So a dash uh, 1 had a 1 in 10 inch twist uh, barrel. The dash 2, like this one, has a 1 in 7 inch twist. And that's just for uh, optimizing for different bullet weights of 5.56. And then of course we have serial number. Um, this is the importer mark because um, this is a machine gun. This was imported by DSA as a full auto. And as such we have the standard military pattern selector switch here, which is full, three round burst, semi-auto, and safe. 
The magazine release is an AK style of paddle. These are nose in rock back style of magazines. These are 20 round mags. They did also make 30s that are interchangeable. And one of the very last modifications to the pattern, done in 1981, was the addition of these lugs on the side of the magazine to allow multiple magazines to be clipped together. So what we can do is put one down into the top like that, and then snap them together like so, and you have a pair of coupled magazines. And you can insert either one like so. So it's a little way to carry a bit of extra ammo on the rifle uh, without having to go into a magazine pouch. We have our bolt hold open and release right here. No real, no additional factory markings on the right side, this is just the remainder of the import mark. Charging handle of course. The iron sights are very much like an HK uh, turret or diopter style of sight. These are, now these are both windage and elevation adjustable on the rear sight, which is nice. And then they are a four position rear sight. So you have an open notch, which does also have a pair of luminous dots as built in night sights. And then we can switch, that's by the way a 100 meter zero. We then have a 200 meter zero, and that is an aperture sight. And then also a 300 and a 400. The front sight is a nice very sharp square post for good precision, typical of the Swiss. Uh, fully hooded to protect it, and then a flip up uh, luminous night sight if, uh, if you need that. I should also point out the front sight can also be adjusted for windage. You can see the hash mark lining it up there, uh, so it's fixed on that side. And using a screwdriver you can adjust the windage of the entire front sight base if you need to make a significant correction there, so that you can keep the rear sight properly zeroed in the middle. We have a pretty basic style of flash hider out here at the muzzle. Uh, one of the other very last developments, uh, and one of the differences between the final adopted 550 and the SIG 541 models, the 550 has a single uh, basically spacer here for rifle grenades. There's a little wire retaining clip that puts a little bit of tension on the grenade so that the rifle grenade doesn't slide off the front of the gun if you happen to tilt it down. The 541 actually had two of these, and they got rid of one. Um, as being counterproductive, I suppose, uh, at the very end of the development process. Back here we also, up here, we also have the bayonet lug, and we have a gas regulator. This is a two position regulator, and it will snap into position there, or there, uh, one for normal use and one for uh, when it's particularly dirty. And then a couple extra features, all of the 550s have integrated bipods. Um, they're not particularly adjustable bipods, they have a little bit of pivot here, um, but not. you can't push into them very well, you can't pull back out of them very well. Uh, but it is a bipod there, which is better than not having one. And in addition they all have folding stocks. So you can push the button in, and the stock folds over. And this lug right here snaps into the stock to hold it in place. So. No positive lock, it's just a tension thing. To open it you just pop it open and pull the stock out. Alright, enough of that, you guys want to see how this is actually in AK. So uh, we will take the lower off, these are cool push pins where you push the outside edge, outside button of the pin to unlock it, and then you push the whole pin through. You can pull that out, do the same thing over here on this pin. That allows me to take the lower receiver off. There is all sorts of stuff going on in here. We have our hammer, we have our uh, auto sear or trip or disconnect. So in full auto, when you are holding the trigger down, when the bolt closes the last thing it does is push this sear down, which releases the hammer to fire. So that prevents, that's this is typical of full auto fire control group designs. Um, this ensures that you don't have hammer follow with either out of battery strikes or light strikes. Um, but the rest of that, you'll, you'll notice that this has a hammer spring much like an AK. This is all essentially stamped sheet metal. Uh, it's 
nice, nicely done sheet metal. It's a little bit more complicated in some ways than in a K lower. Not, not hugely so, but... Uh, now if we move on to the upper, one of the interesting things is the recoil spring is located in the gas tube. So I still have spring tension on this with the buttstock removed. To disassemble this I'm going to pull out the charging handle. It's the charging handle that connects the bolt carrier to the recoil spring. So if I take this lever, pull it down, that unlocks the handle. That allows me to pull this handle out. And then the bolt carrier will just slide out the back. That is the end of the gas piston, which locks into the charging handle like so. So here is our bolt and carrier. That is most definitely taken from an AK. So it's not a copy, obviously, it's not interchangeable, but this is absolutely um, a redesign or a reimagining of an AK bolt and carrier system. Uh, same tail here to prevent, uh, as an extra safety, to prevent hammer follow. The only big difference here is the gas piston is not permanently attached to the bolt carrier like it is on an AK. We have a stamped sheet metal upper, a uh, little bit of a rubber gasket here that's actually riveted into the receiver. Uh, this, this is the equivalent of using the AK safety to seal up the charging handle slot in the side of the receiver. Um, that rubber gasket just opens up and reseals behind the charging handle with each shot. You can see we have some guide rails here. We have an ejector that is very similar to an AK. Um, basically a pretty simple stamped upper with things like the rear trunnion here welded in, or the rear pin connection welded in, and the rear sight welded on. I can take the handguard off by pulling the bottom handguard back just slightly. That disconnects it from the upper handguard. And then we can just lift it off. And the upper handguard comes out. These two lock together in normal use with these hooks locking behind those lugs. So there's your handguard with its bipod. We now have a gas tube and the gas piston and spring inside it. And I can take this out by depressing this little plunger, rotating the gas tube 90 degrees, and then this slides out. I can then rotate the gas plug on the inside. And there is our gas piston. So like I said, the recoil spring is located around the gas piston. People often mention how this is a, a bad idea because heat in the gas piston will cause the spring to lose its temper. That's That can be a thing on machine guns, like the Degturev, the early pattern of the Degturev. On a self-loading rifle like the SIG 550, there's really not going to be enough heat to ever cause that sort of problem. This isn't something that's being used as a sustained fire machine gun. So here is the gas tube that's going to hold that spring and piston. And our gas port, our gas plug, has two separate gas ports, one large and one small right there. And there you go, there is the whole SIG 550 aka Sturmgewehr 90 fully disassembled. It really did take a while for these guns to go from SIG's prototyping to actual uh, Swiss military issue. Uh, 1986 the very first units actually received these rifles, and there were some recon troops and some mountain troops, some Gebersjager, uh, got their 550s. Uh, 1988 the first couple of standard infantry regiments were equipped with rifles. It wasn't until 91-1992 that the rifles were actually in full-scale production at SIG, and this was a major production undertaking. They, the order from the Swiss government was for something on the order of 600,000 of these rifles. That is essentially enough to fully equip the Swiss army during emergency military uh, mobilization, which is a lot of Swiss guys with rifles. So uh, these would become, of course, the standard rifle for the Swiss military, and they're widely renowned as particularly effective, accurate, reliable 
really high quality rifles. Uh, they have a lot of good features to them, the bipods, the rifle grenade features, uh, actually good sights. It's impressive to me how much better these sights are to use than the HK apertures that are very similar in overall design. So uh, there would be a number of other patterns that would follow. They made a 551 or a 550 sniper model, which I also have a, a video on, and then they would do a series of shortened rifles, uh, 551, 552. Um, so there are a lot of variations on this, but the pattern we have here is the standard Swiss Army model. So oh, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Again, a big thanks to the Bear Arms Reference Collection for giving me access to this one to show to you guys. Thanks for watching.